this morning we're continuing our sermon series through 1 Peter. We'll be looking at 1 Peter 3, 8 through 22. And in these verses, Peter quotes Psalm 84. And so our corresponding Old Testament reading will come from the book of Psalms and Psalm 34. If you have Bibles, you're welcome to read along with me, or else you're free to read the text as it is projected. Psalm 34, we'll read verses 8 through 18. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers them from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. And then we're going to turn to the New Testament and to 1 Peter 3, and we'll pick up what Peter is teaching where we left off last time at verse 8, 1 Peter 3, beginning at verse 8. And in this section of the epistle, he has a little excursus on baptism which I'm largely going to ignore because it would just make the, the message too long. If you want to ask me questions about it afterwards, feel free to do so. We're going to begin our reading at verse 8 and read to the end of verse 22, 1 Peter 3. Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, And his ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats, do not be frightened, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil for Christ also suffered once for sins the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God he was put to death in the body but made alive in the spirit and being made alive he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. This is the word of the Lord. Tim Keller tells a story of something that happened to him while he was the pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City. 
He was standing in the doorway following one of the morning services, and he noticed that there was a woman off to the side, kind of lingering. And eventually she approached him, and she said to him, I'm not a Christian believer, but I've been coming to church now for a few weeks, and I'm going to keep coming because I'm learning so much. And Keller said to her, well, what was it that made you, as an unbeliever, think about coming to church? And she said, well, I work on Wall Street in senior management. I report directly to the vice president of my firm. And a couple of weeks ago, I made a very big mistake at work. And the vice president and I were dragged into the office of the CEO, and the CEO tore a strip off me. But the vice president interjected, and he said, it's not her fault, it's my fault. And I'm responsible for this error. And immediately the demeanor of the CEO changed and the conversation improved. And everything turned out to be fine. And so she said to the vice president as they were leaving the office, no one has ever taken the blame for me before. What motivated you to do it? And the gentleman, the vice president of this firm, said, well, I'm a Christian, and I have a Savior who took the blame for me. And she said, what church do you go to? And she ended up going to Redeemer Presbyterian Church. If you read on in 1 Peter, get to chapter 4, you will see that the ancient world responded to the virtue of early Christians with, and this is the word that Peter uses, surprise. There ought to be something surprising about the lifestyle of Christians. And people alongside of whom you work, and people alongside of whom you live, if they have not had an encounter with Christ, if they do not know who He is, should be surprised by how you live and should say to themselves, I've never seen anyone who lives like that or who talks like that or who responds like that because the gospel makes you odd. And we're going to see this morning that because of the gospel, you practice odd retaliation. And as we go through these verses from 1 Peter 3, we're going to see that Peter summons us, first of all, to live virtuously, and then secondly, to revere Christ. We as Christians, having been transformed by the gospel, practice odd retaliation. We're going to see that we need to live virtuously, and secondly, we need to revere Christ. Now, if you look at the context of our passage, you'll note that Peter has been talking about the transformative power of the gospel in every and any sphere of life. He's addressed the sphere of state. He's addressed the sphere of the workplace. He's addressed the sphere of the family. Within these spheres, he's addressed different categories of people, masters and slaves and husbands and wives, and now he's wrapping up his exhortation. He's concluding, and he turns to all of the members, and he says, finally, all of you. What he says next is going to have relevance for anyone and everyone, whether married or unmarried, whether in the workforce or not in the workforce. And he proceeds to list five virtues, and he does so by means of a literary device. Here's your word of the day, chiasm. I wonder how many people know what a chiasm is. It's a literary structure of inverted parallelism. So the structure is A, B, C, B, A. It's a little bit like a sandwich. 
where you have, you know, you have the, the slices of bread on the outside, the outer layers, and then in the middle layers you may have butter, and then in the center you have bologna or something like that. And interestingly, every day for us is a chiasm of sorts. Chiasms are built into the, the very fabric of existence. So in the morning, where do you find yourself? In bed, A. What do you do next? Eat, B. What do you do then? You go to work or school, C. Then what do you do? You go home and you eat, B. And you end up where? Back in bed, A. In fact, you can argue, and I don't want to belabor this point, but you could argue that the entirety of life is a chiasm. You begin under the care of others, in diapers. You know where I'm going with this. And you live your life, B, and you end up, in many cases, in the care of others and in diapers. Again, A, B, A. Well, here in verse 8, you have an instance of a chiasm, and there's another chiasm that Peter's going to use in a moment, and so it's important for us to understand how this works. Five virtues presented in a chiastic structure, and on the ends of the chiasm, you have like-minded or single-minded and humble-minded. Now, it's not apparent from our English translations that these are the words, but in the Greek, you have the word minded in both instances, single-minded and humble-minded. The outer layers of the chiasm, the outer layers of the sandwich, and they belong together because they communicate the same message. And the message is this, that we must subordinate our personal preferences to the preferences of Christ. And that's how you achieve unity in a congregation. You're always asking the single question, not what do I prefer, but what does Jesus prefer? And what does Jesus want? And by being single-minded, you're also being humble-minded because you're subordinating your own preferences in favor of those of Jesus. And then in the inner middle layers, you have sympathetic and compassion. We need to be touched by the joys and the sorrows of others. I was talking to a gentleman outside the church this morning who one day had a son get married and the next day had a daughter in a car accident. Within a short span of time, entered into the spectrum of emotions that one might have. And we need to be touched by the joys and sorrows of others. And to do that, we need to live in close proximity with, with each other. And this is one of the reasons why at Blessings Christian Church we have small groups so that we're not detached from other people, but we're living closely with each other so that we can enter into each other's joys and sorrows. As the Apostle Paul says in one place, we need to weep with those who weep, and rejoice with those who rejoice. I want to pose this question to you. Which do you think is easier? To weep with those who weep or to rejoice with those who rejoice? I think it's easier for many to weep with those who weep. But if you're single this morning and you're wanting to get married, can you rejoice at someone's wedding? If you're infertile this morning and you want a child, can you Rejoice when someone has a child? Are you able to rejoice when you see the success of someone else, when you see somebody promoted? Are you able to rejoice when you see somebody retiring, or are you jealous? And then at the very center of the chiasm, the, the, the central clause, love one another, in the Greek it's philadelphoi. Brotherly, love. And of course, in the church, we must learn to love those who Jesus loves and to befriend those whom Jesus befriends. And what you find at the Lord's table is not our guest list, but God's guest list. And that's why Jamie Smith says in one of his books that at the Lord's Supper, we learn to love people we sometimes don't like. 
But at the heart of the matter is love, the great gift. And then it's as if uh, Peter enlarges his perspective and begins to take the whole world into view. A world then that was quite opposed to Christians. And he urges the believers, the readers of his letter, not to repay evil with evil or insult with insult. Now, if you know anything about the ancient world, you know that human relationships and human transactions were premised on reciprocity, tit for tat, quid pro quo. And in an orbit of reciprocity, revenge is a virtue. Now, I don't know how many of you follow politics, but recently the U.S. president imposed tariffs on steel imports. And he had a meeting with other leaders of the G7 in Quebec, and our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, had the opportunity to sit down with the U.S. President Trump and protest these tariffs and urge him to rescind them. And then afterwards, Trudeau had a press conference in which he said, I was not bullied by the U.S. President. And the U.S. President responded, perhaps by a tweet, I'm not sure how, but he said something like, Canada is going to have to pay for that. Now, that's revenge, right? You feel injured and you want to injure back. Peter says something here that's counterintuitive and entirely countercultural. He says, don't repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but repay evil with blessing because to this you were called. Because, he says, you are a royal priesthood, and what do priests do? They bless people. So when you are insulted, when you are offended, respond with blessing. Now this is an instinct that Peter has learned from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Because Jesus taught that we are to love our enemies and do good to those who hate us and bless those who curse us and pray for those who persecute us. And it wasn't only something that Jesus taught, it was something that Jesus lived out. And Peter refers to this in the previous chapter, chapter 2, where he says, Jesus, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return, but entrusted himself to the judge who judges justly. And when he was on the cross, being crucified... He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And perhaps this morning you find that to be a very intimidating ethic. You know, how can we practice that kind of graciousness with people? How can we resist the impulse to take revenge? I want to suggest to you this morning that in some sense this might not be so intimidating, but actually liberating and empowering because if you look at the example of Jesus on the cross, you have people wanting to harm him, wanting to hurt him, hitting him, nailing him to the cross, but they can't stop Jesus from being Jesus. And so some interesting way, Jesus continued to have power over them. They can't rob from him his character. And it can be very empowering for you and for me and quite liberating to respond to people against their expectations with blessing and with mercy. And I suspect some of you at some point have experienced what that's like, and it's a remarkable feeling, and it's a powerful message to convey. When you are offended, you should not take matters into your own hands, and you don't need to be afraid, Peter says. He quotes this psalm, and then he says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. It's Psalm 34, isn't it? The ears of the Lord are attentive to their cries. And I think the question that Peter is asking, well, I know this is the question he's asking because it's in the text, but who's going to harm you? The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. His ears are attentive to their cries. Speaking to people who were persecuted, 
And it reminds us a little bit of what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? If he gave up his one and only Son, how will he not along with him graciously give us all things? What can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Shall hardship or trouble or persecution or danger or nakedness or sword or peril or... And all these things, Paul says, we are more than conquerors. So he's urging us, first of all, Peter, to live virtuously these five virtues in a chiastic arrangement and then not repaying evil with evil, etc. This is... (laughs) Did you hear that? (laughs) That was Siri saying, I'm not sure I understand. (laughs) That was incredible. And I've I've long suspected that Siri is an atheist. (laughs) I've long suspected that. Having to live out these virtues may seem burdensome, but it's actually the easy yoke of Christ that he puts on us, the yoke that fits. Because if you are a Christian believer, you're living with the resources of Christ at your disposal. Peter refers, it's neighbor to verse 16 or so, to your, your good behavior in Christ, a wonderful phrase, because we live out our lives united to Christ with his grace flowing through us, having been born again, as he's talked about later. And Peter goes on to explain how this is true in terms of three fundamental and significant events in the life of Jesus. And the first is that Jesus died. Peter says he was put to death. He didn't die of natural causes. He was put to death, and like the death of a seed, his death was fruitful and bore a harvest. Because on account of your sins, you were estranged from God. You were alienated from him. But what does Peter say? Christ suffered the just for the unjust to bring us to God. To remove the obstacles that stood in the way because of our sin. To give us access to the Father. To bring us to God. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can be paralyzed by guilt. And you think about things that you've said that you shouldn't have said, things that you've done that you shouldn't have done, and it can be paralyzing. And Peter says you need to remember that Jesus died for you to pay for those sins, to give you access to the Father, so you can be confident of the Father's embrace. Second, he said Jesus rose from the dead. He he was put to death, but then made alive by the Spirit. Peter says, Jesus engaged the powers of death, but death could not keep him down. He conquered death, and therefore he's able to free those, as the writer of the Hebrews says, who are held in slavery by fear of death, and so you don't need to be afraid of death. Because Jesus, you see, is not only the Lord over the guilt, over guilt, he's the Lord over death, And in your heart, you need to revere him as the Lord over guilt and as the Lord over death. And then thirdly, he says, Jesus has ascended. And here, I need to introduce you to the second chiasm. These are very, very difficult verses to understand. Jesus going and speaking to the imprisoned spirits, what's exactly that all about? I think we're helped when we see the chiasm here. So it works like this. The outer layers of the chiasm you find in 3.18 in chapter 4, verse 1, which talk about Christ suffering. And then in the inner layers, you have people being saved through water, the flood in verse 20, and then baptism in verse 21. And in the middle layers, you have Jesus going somewhere and doing something. 
With that chiasm in mind, you, you, you see that verse 19 and verse 22 are parallel. They explain each other. They clarify each other. And that means that Jesus went and preached to the imprisoned spirits when he ascended. That's the point when Jesus does it. He preaches to imprisoned demons, imprisoned fallen angels. We don't know what exactly he says, but we can guess on the basis of verse 22 that it was a, a declaration of victory to these imprisoned spirits. Now, you have to remember that the people to whom Peter is writing were opposed and they were oppressed socially, economically, sometimes physically. And they wanted nothing more than to hear good news. And I suspect you want to hear good news, and it's what Peter provides. Well, how is this good news? These imprisoned spirits that Peter is talking about are still active demons in the world. You say, well, how does that work? They're waiting for God's judgment. They're imprisoned. True. But the devil, John says in the book of Revelation, is bound, and yet Peter says, chapter 5, that he's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so these spirits, though imprisoned, still have power in the world. And they're responsible for a lot of the wickedness that you encounter, and they're behind the persecution of the church. And can you think of a time in history when there was unparalleled immorality? When these demons, these false angels were wreaking havoc in the world? Well, you say that would have to be the time of Noah. One of the darkest chapters in human history where these spirits had blinded the entire population of the world aside from eight individuals, the family of Noah. And now Peter is saying, Jesus went and preached to those imprisoned spirits who blinded people back in the days of Noah. And he preached a victory sermon. Those imprisoned spirits know that their doom is sure. Know that Christ has triumphed over them. And you should know that they know that. Because it may not seem like it, but the battle's over. And Jesus has won. And Martin Luther puts this so nicely in his hymn, A Mighty Fortress. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. And so Peter is saying, in your hearts, revere Christ as the Lord over guilt. In your hearts, revere Christ as the Lord over death. In your hearts, revere Christ as the Lord over evil. The gospel makes you awed. And you at times will say and do things that surprise others. And at some point, you should have someone approach you, like the woman who approached her vice president in New York City, asking what motivates you to live the way you do. And when that happens, Peter says you have to be prepared to give an answer of the hope that is in you. And that's evangelistic, isn't it? We, we can make a distinction uh, between direct evangelism, you know, people being called to, to go forth and confront people verbally with the claims of Jesus. Paul was that kind of evangelist. He says to the Colossians, listen, um, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Pray that I have opportunities to preach the gospel. 
And then he goes on to talk about what Dick Lucas calls responsive evangelism. He follows it up immediately with this to the Colossians now. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So while some are to be looking for opportunities for direct evangelism, all of us should be looking for and praying for opportunities for responsive evangelism. The gospel makes you awed, and because of the transformative power of the gospel, you will practice, you ought to practice, awed retaliation, repaying evil with blessing. And when you live that kind of lifestyle, people are going to approach you and ask you about it. Are you prepared to give an answer of the hope that is in you? Let's pray together. Gracious Father, thank you for speaking to us this morning, for reminding us of the great work of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who not only taught us to live in a certain way, but who himself lived in a certain way, and by that way has delivered us from slavery and has freed us We pray that you would enable us to see the true liberty that we have in the Lord Jesus. Freedom from guilt, freedom from fear of death, freedom from the power of evil. Help us to live wisely in that freedom. And we pray that by means of the gospel and through your spirit and with the resources of the grace of our Savior, we might live increasingly odd lives that attract interest and provoke questions. And we pray that we would be prepared to answer those who question. In Jesus' name, amen.